Definitely, definitely. Got a little stool here today. I'm going to sit here. Probably not for long because I'm going to have to stand up. Um, but I want the world to sing in her native tongue, to sing it like when we were young, back before the pendulum had swung to the shadow. Um, that is the hope. We're, we're in a new series called Origins of Innocence, and we're trying to take a look back at what God intended for humanity, for creation, for you and for me, before there was a fall, a rebellion, um, before there was a mistake, a sin made by our forefathers, um, Adam and those guys. And, uh, and if we can really see maybe what God intended for us there, maybe we'll get a better picture of what God has intended for us in Christ Jesus. Um, the concept that in Christ Jesus, we are now the righteousness of God. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. We are made to be holy and blameless in his sight in Christ Jesus. We have so much in Christ Jesus. And, and, and so we're looking back towards the beginning and say, what, what did it look like there? What did it look like when God first created the world? Maybe that'll give us a picture as to what we're, we're, we're trying to find even now um, in Christ Jesus. So that's the concept. That's the, the, the hope that we learn to, to sing like when we were young in that native tongue. Um, I also wrote it this way. I um, hope and pray that we will all, um, no, there it is. I want all of us to be who God made us to be, which is who we really want to be so that we can do a lot of good for our people, the people that we love and the people that God has asked us to love. We just want to grow more into who we were made to be. We all know that there's a part of us, a sinful, broken nature, that we don't want to live out of. We're tired of living out of that and producing what it produces, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of the people that we love. And so we're trying to figure out what is this new nature that God has implanted in us, in Christ Jesus, and how can we begin to live out of that nature, which produces things very different than what our sinful nature produces. So this is the concept. This is the thing. And this is what I felt like the Lord was saying um, during our worship time, that it's hard for us to believe, but this is what Jesus was speaking over us, speaking to us, um, that he can change your stars, he can change your stripes, he can bring new wine out of that cold, hardened, broken heart inside of you. You can't do it. With all your willpower, with all your clever scheming and strategizing, you just can't seem to squeeze anything that good and beautiful and life-giving out of that heart that's been battered and broken by your sin, the sin of humanity, by the sin of those that were supposed to care for you well. But Jesus, if you will place that broken, battered heart into his hands, he can begin to transform it, reform it, and begin to bring new wine, living water, out of that heart that he made in the first place and knows exactly how it's supposed to be, how it's supposed to feel, and what it's capable of. But you gotta trust him with it, day in and day out, storm or in nice weather. And it's tricky to do that. But take his hand and walk with him. He alone knows who you are, who were you were made to be, and who you can be. So that's the premise of all of this, this whole series that we're going through. Um, we've got some sermon notes for you, because I'm so serious about this message, this sermon series, and I haven't cared about any of the other sermon series. Um, just kidding, just kidding. But I'm just trying to like, oh, Lord, I don't want to mess this one up. So I, we've got some sermon notes there in front of you. Um, that one section, I think you've got native tongue. I want the world to sing in her native tongue, um, to sing it like when we were young, back before the pendulum 
had swung to the shadow. It's kind of a little backdrop for us as we're moving through this series. Um, all right, so let's jump in. Uh, we have a little timeline that we, we got not last week, a timeline of innocence. Um, but we, were, we were created in innocence. God created humanity in innocence. Adam and Eve were naked and not in shame. That's the picture that God inspired the writer of the book of Genesis, Genesis to give us. This is kind of what it felt like, looked like, if you were to picture this. Um, naked and not ashamed. But then at some point there was a fall. We call it the fall of Adam or the fall of humanity. It was basically Adam's rebellion. It was Adam deciding to go with what the serpent said, with what Eve said, uh, to go against what God had said. He believed something other than what God had spoken to him. And it created this fall. And now humanity, each one of us born of the seed of Adam, the first Adam, we are now born into shame. You see, you see that that like gritty little line down there, yeah. That's what we know, that's what we're most familiar with. We are never naked and unashamed. We are naked and ashamed. We are born into shame, we're so familiar with it. You don't teach your kids how to sin and and do wrong and try to cover up and be selfish, they just are good at it, naturally. At least my kids are, they're awesome at it. (laughs) They rule at it. (laughs) Um, So we're born into this shame, yet what the scripture teaches What we're trying to remind ourselves is that God's plan for humanity, his good intentions for creation, his innocence that he wanted us to know and experience and live in, it never stopped. The gifts and callings of God are irrevocable, the Bible says. So what he created for humanity, it wasn't like, oh, we lost it. No, we we actually begin to know something else but it never stopped. And so there were guys like Abraham who believed God and it was accounted unto them as righteousness. They began to experience both. Yes, they were men of shame, wrestling with the sinful nature, but at the same time, they were also able to breathe in these innocent, abundant skies in their life. They were able to rise above for these moments and do something that was very, very godly and experience a friendship with God like what was experienced in the Garden of Eden at the same time of living in this midst of shame. And that is our reality. That is our situation. And then we have the cross. The cross there kind of helped us understand all of this. There was a second Adam that came. His name was Jesus Christ. He was God's son, created in his image, or not created, just issued forth as his substance. And he came and he lived this life of righteousness. And he was the second Adam we learn in the book of Romans. And those who are born of his seed, those who are created in him, in Christ Jesus, now are born into this innocence and have this new nature living inside of them. And yes, it's crazy and frustrating that we have two natures inside of us, a sinful nature that wants the things in opposition to God that we got from Adam. And now we have this this nature that has been born in us through Christ Jesus that wants the things of God. And it's this wrestling match, and we read about it in Romans 7 last week, where even Paul, who's this mighty man of faith, is like, ah, yeah, the things I don't want to do, I keep doing. And the things I really, really want to do, I don't even do them. And I find this struggle within me, this battle between shame and innocence, shame and innocence. Who will save me from this body of death is what he says. And then we get to Romans 8 and he says, now here's the good news. Jesus Christ can save us because in him there's no condemnation for the shame or the sin no matter how grievous or horrible it is, when you stand before Jesus Christ, there's no condemnation. That's amazing. Not only is there no condemnation, but there's no consequence anymore for those who are in Christ Jesus because Jesus actually paid for it on the cross. He took it for you. And then he not only tells you this is the right way he goes, but he puts his spirit inside of you to help you war with that sinful nature to help you overcome that sinful nature. And it takes a while. It takes like riding a bike. You get on that, you start trying to live after the Spirit, and you're like, come on, come on, come on. You're crashing all the time. But over time, all of a sudden, you get 100 feet, 200 feet. You start riding with no hands. But until that, whoa, 
Put my thing. Hey, there it is. Until that second up little thing, until the end of shame, we're going to deal with this innocence and shame combination. But at that point, Christ returns, and we're going to talk about that at the last Sunday in this year. Ooh, it's going to be nice. But we're going to talk about the innocence that has been promised to us where there is a time, there is a day, there is an hour set by our Father where there will be no more shame. Our sinful nature will not be anymore. We will only have the nature that Christ has given us. Woo! What a day of rejoicing that will be. But in the midst of this, we're trying to figure out how to live shame and innocence all at the same time. Native tongue, timeline of innocence. Here's a question for you. Let me cross my legs before I ask this question. How are you doing today, guys? How was your week? Yeah? And Mark's laughing because he does this all the time. <laughs> yeah. What's the question? How much alone time do you spend with God? Every month, every week. This doesn't count, by the way. None of you are alone. We're all watching you. And when you spend that alone time with God, how close do you feel? And we got some options there on your sermon notes. You feel far away? In the, in the same neighborhood? <laughs> or hand in hand. And yes, feelings are not 100% trustworthy, no doubt about that, we all know that at this point, but feelings do help us. They are a way that we can discern what's happening physically, emotionally, spiritually. So they are okay questions to ask. And obviously the hope, the goal, is that we will spend most of our lives feeling very hand-in-hand hand with God. And some of you at this point are saying, I don't even know what you're talking about. And that's fine too. Hopefully it'll make some sense by the end of this message. So what are God's good intentions that he created in the beginning? First of all, I think it's important for us to check out Genesis. That's where we get the story, the poem of creation, the biblical account. Um, and in Genesis chapter 1, verse 24 and 27, I want you guys to notice something here that is very important as you begin to understand who God made you to be. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. So God has created a lot of living things. And now he's saying, I want everyone to, I want all of the creation to produce after its own kind. The livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals, each according to their kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kind, the livestock according to their kind, the creatures that move along the ground according to their kind. And God saw that it was good. And the word kind here is likeness. So obviously we understand that a snake, when it has a baby, looks like a snake. You know, doesn't look like a monkey. Looks like a snake. Out of their own likeness, in their own image, that's how things are going to create. Then God said, however, with this next part of creation, let us make mankind, check this, let us make mankind in our image. Something very, very different is taking place in creation right now. God made all the plants to create after their kind. God made all of the animals to create after their kind. And then he said, you know what? I want to create something that looks like us. I want to create something in our image, Imago Dei. Something that has our likeness. That's wild. You, you have the image of the Creator. You were made in the likeness of God Himself. All of the rest of creation, God had an idea. I wanted to look and feel and act like this. And then I wanted to make everything, you know, after that likeness. But when it came to you and I, God decided to make you and I look, reflect, 
act, know, be in his likeness. It's amazing. So God created mankind in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. He didn't create man in his image. He created male and female in his image. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And as they were created in his image, he gave them dominion over the rest. To care for them. To nurture. To bless with dominion. So that's the first thing, that we were made, we were created in the image of God. You were created in the image of God. Whatever you feel about yourself right now, no matter how marred or broken you might be because of this world and the storms and the sin that come, you will never and can never lose the image of God that God created you in. You were made in his image. Second thing, that we have is walking in the image of God. What's so interesting to me is what we see pictured for us in the scriptures about what it was like when people were living and experiencing innocence. In Genesis 3, 8, we have just this little illusion where, um, where we're, we're not gonna talk about it this week, we'll talk about it next week, but where the fall actually happened. But, but what we have is we have God showing up in the garden in the cool of the day, and there he's coming to meet with Adam and Eve, to be with them, to walk with them, to, to interact with them. I don't know what they did. If they did math, probably not. Um, or if they just ate some food, or, or if God taught them some things, or if they just enjoyed each other's presence and laughed. I don't know what it was. But it seemed like once a day, there was a time where God and Adam and Eve hung out. And it's so interesting because here in this innocence, you know, what, what we're trying to get back to, some of us think it's like, oh, we have to be like spending time with God a thousand hours a day and, and working so hard and striving. But when you look at what innocence was, it was not like that. It was spending time with God once a day. Taking time to remember the Creator and breathe in what He has to breathe and hear his words and know his heart and remind yourself of what your image is to look like. Not only that, but in that moment, they, they walked with God daily. They didn't hide from God. When the presence of God showed up, they didn't feel the need to hide, but instead they, they, could, they could just be who they were before God. And hopefully some of you are getting to a point in your relationship with God where when you sin, when you blow it, when you have a bad attitude, when you do something worse, it's quick and easy for you to go to God and say sorry. That can happen. Where your relationship with God is easy in that way. I'm not saying it's easy when you gotta go tell your wife sorry. You're a big jerk. I don't know how to make that easy. You gotta find somebody else for that. It's always hard. But I have come to a place in my relationship with God where I feel like I really can go to him with anything. And that's a big change. But that's what innocence was. It was not being afraid of God ever again. And not only that, but they were not ashamed of their imperfections. They weren't going around comparing themselves. Well, should I go to God today? Well, I've had a good day, so let's go be with God. They were naked. They, they knew they were not actually the image of God. God was still much more vast and broad and beautiful and everything, yet they were okay with who they were. Just like a child. A child doesn't compare themselves to me, like I was talking about my nephew last week. He doesn't compare himself to me because I'm way better at everything than him. I wish he was here to hear that. <laughs> he's very okay when I beat him at anything, or I'm better, because he's like, Psh, whatever. I'm getting better. And that's a great attitude to have. That was what they had. They enjoyed and cared for creation, and that's what's interesting is because, they, you know, we think about what God has created the world. There's so many bad things out there. 
Well, that's the shame teaching us that. When God created the world, he created the world with everything for them to enjoy except for one tree. God doesn't want to limit your life and make you into this very safe, secure, small-minded, tiny little person that is only to en- able to enjoy church. I'm sorry, if church is the only thing in Christ that you enjoy, you're probably not fun to be with. Don't call me to hang out, you know? I would rather hang out with somebody else. God is not interested in making you good at church. That has never been his plan for your life. And church is what? You know, a few hours a week maybe. For some of you, a couple hours every year. What? No, you, that's not you. We'll see those people on Christmas and Easter. <laughs> oh, just kidding. I, that's good. Whatever. Whatever. God, God is trying to make you good at life and, they, and teaching you how to enjoy all of the creation that he has for you without being mastered by any of it. But he wants you to enjoy everything. He made it for your enjoyment. And yet we have kind of get it backwards sometimes. And the last thing that I think is interesting is they trusted God about the restriction. When it came time to wrestling with, well, something inside me really wants this thing. Something inside me is drawn to this one tree. Or I have this question in my mind that's kind of, well, maybe what if this is a good thing for me? I mean, that, that's going to happen to all of us. And, and we have to trust God even more so than our own heart. And they were able to do that, and it helped them to experience innocence. We've got to trust God about the restrictions. No matter what Supreme Court is telling us, no matter what the laws of the land change this way or that, for the good or for the bad, whatever, we've got to trust God about the restrictions. He knows your heart, and he is so interested in seeing it become like the Grinch ten times bigger that day. He would never restrict something from you that was good for you. So that's innocence. Um, And this last thing, receiving our image of God. So we got to do a little work right now. Go to Galatians chapter 4. It's time for a little Bible study, giving you a lot of freebies here, but now you got to put your brain uh, engaged and uh, get to work here. Because it's Paul. Paul and his run-on sentences. Here we go. Chapter 4, verse 1. Bless you. Um, What I am saying, Paul saying, is that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were under age, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. So basically he's talking legal terms here. So the lawyers in the room, you're like, bam, easy. Let's go on to the next thing. But everybody else, okay, track with me. So basically he's just talking about you, you as a young person have an inheritance from your guardian, from your parents. But a lot of times those parents will have a certain age set to where you won't get the full inheritance until you come of age at this certain point. And until then, they usually put a guardian or some sort of caretaker for you to make sure that you actually get to that point where you're able to receive everything. And, and that's what basically Paul is saying. That was all of us. And we got the timeline up there. That, all of us were born into this situation, but the inheritance has always been there. And God's constantly trying to teach us about this inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus. But all of us have lived under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. You could go in thus deep waters right there. That's very deep waters. We don't have time for all of that. But basically, it's all these things that can master us. And Paul specifically is saying one of the things is legalism. The law is what was a master for the Jews until the fullness of Christ came, where they no longer need the law like that as a guardian because now they have the spirit of Christ that can teach them the way to go. And so for us, there's all kinds of elemental spiritual, but it's basically the lies that we believe or the guardians that are over us that are keeping us from the fullness of Christ. And he's saying that once we come of age, we don't have to deal with that anymore. Verse 4, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those that were under the law or whatever elemental spiritual force you might be under. That we might receive adoption to sonship because you are his sons. God sent the spirit of his son into your heart 
the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Formerly, he kind of just recaps here, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. You served creation rather than the creator. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, deep waters again, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Paul's saying that there was this time where you were in slavery, but in Christ you have been set free. So don't go back and settle for slavery again. Learn to live as a free person. And it's hard to live as a free person. It's like living left-handed for those of us that are right-handed. If you're left-handed, I don't know how to talk to you. I got no idea, you know? Except my grandpa. Well, everyone who's left-handed is in their right brain. You know, that was his favorite joke in all of that, but I didn't get that either. Um, so basically, there's this time when Christ came, he changed things so that we no longer have to live as slaves to the amount of forces. We can live in this innocence and learn to walk in it, but it takes time. It takes time. And then go to chapter 5, and we'll see kind of basically what, uh, what, um, how it looks in, in, in practical life. It is for freedom that Christ is, no, sorry, verse 16. That's verse 1. Yeah, chapter 16. I mean, verse, <laughs> chapter 5, verse 16. Bam, there it is. So I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before, those who live this way will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, when we walk in the Spirit, it's love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things, there is no law. There is no power against it. Those who believe, belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So basically he's saying when you're living out of this nature that Adam gave you, it's going to look like all of these things. But when you're living out of the nature that Christ has born in you, through his spirit, it's going to look like these things. And I love this line. He says, so since we, have, since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. That's it. That's it. How do you learn to walk in this innocence? How do you learn to overcome shame and the strongholds and the lies in your life? You continue to walk with the Spirit. And one of my favorite pictures of this in the Bible is a guy named Gideon. Gideon, I got to stand up for this one. This one's too good. Gideon was a guy who... We find in scriptures, Judges chapter 6 and 7, um, where all of a sudden the, 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 the movie camera pans over to this guy Gideon. And he's, you can just picture him. He's kind of like shrunk down. He's, he's hiding out. He's kind of built up these things around him. And he's there trying to make himself a little bit of food. Because the problem was the Midianites had come and they had destroyed all of the, the weapons and warfare in Israel and they had basically stolen all their food. They weren't even allowing the Israelites to have any grain anymore to make food. And Gideon had snuck a little bit out and he's like trying to make himself a little cracker. Yummy, yummy. And it's this angel of the Lord shows up to him and says, Gideon! I'm sure he hid even more. And the angel's like, Gideon! And he's again, he just kind of moves away his little protective stuff. Get in! And he's like, Aah. he's totally freaked out by this angel. And the angel's like, you are a mighty man of valor. And now Gideon's cracking up. He's like, you are insane. <laughs> and uh, we go through this whole process with Gideon where God says to him, I want you to set all of my people free. I want you to overcome the Midianites. 
And, and you fast forward through multiple, multiple steps. Over here, you have Gideon doing just that. It's just a couple chapters. You can read the story if you want it more full. Judges 6 and 7. But it's the story of how God took someone who was living out of this nature where he didn't realize that he was created in the image of God. He didn't really know how to walk in the image of God. He didn't know what God had in store for him. He didn't, he didn't know all of those things. Or maybe he did and he was just having trouble believing him. But this angel shows up to him and says, you're a mighty man of valor. And, and it's so funny because Gideon does a whole bunch of weird stuff right there just because he thinks if he sees God, he's going to die. Which is just that sh same shame where it's like, if God shows up, I'm going to die. I have to hide. I have to run. I have to quick make a sacrifice. And so he makes a sacrifice. He actually says to the angel, hey, could you wait right here? I'm going to go get a sacrifice. And he runs away and he gets the sacrifice and he comes back and the angel's still there just going like, what is happening right now? And he makes a sacrifice and says, there, now can I live? And the angel's like, you're not going to die. You never were going to die. <laughs> but then the angel gives him one job to do. He says, I want you to go into your father's house where he set up that, that idol in the middle of the town. I want you to tear it down. So how is Gideon going to get to become a man, mighty man of valor? Is it through strategy? Is it through strength? Is it striving? Or did he start doing push-ups? Just be like, here it comes, here it comes. No, he just learned to walk and step and stride with the Spirit. And the Spirit said, first thing I want you to do, take my hand and I want you to go and I want you to tear down that idol in your father's house. And so Gideon, this mighty man of valor, goes at the darkest time of night <laughs> in the sneakiest way possible and does it and then goes and hides again. And the town is all in uproar because they're like, somebody just tore down this idol. Now that God's going to be mad at us. The Midians will be mad at us. Who did this? And they go on a search. And Gideon never once says, like, I did it. Hallelujah. <laughs> He just hides out until finally they figure out it was him, and he's like, eh. but then they don't do anything to him. And step one is complete. And then with Gideon, it's hilarious because it took a lot more steps. The Lord said, okay, now come to this one. Now go to this one. Now do this little thing. And he did all of them so sheepishly, fearfully, all of those things, but it was enough for God to work out. And then this is the image on your, um, on your sermon notes. Right before the big battle is about to happen, Gideon is still so freaked out. Even though God has met him so many times along the process, he's still so nervous, so unsure of who he is, so doubtful of what God can do and what he can do. And God says, Gideon, I know you're still freaked out. This is what I want you to do. I want you to get up and I want you to walk at night into the Midian camp where they're all encamped out. And I want you to go to this one tent. And so it's scary, but he... He says, okay, God, I'm going to walk with you. And he does one more step that God asked him to do. And he goes down and he skits up and he crouches next to this tent. And inside the tent, check this out, there's two men. And one of them wakes up from a dream. He's like, oh, I just had a dream. It was a crazy dream. And the other was like, what happened? He said, well, I saw this biscuit of barley. And it, it just started like rolling down and it started just destroying all the tents. And... And it, and it destroyed all of Midian. And, then, and the person next to him goes, that's got to be Gideon. <laughs> that's it. And then Gideon walks back. Well, that was interesting. <laughs> and, and there's a couple things. That one, it's like God was still so willing to work with all of his fears and all of his shame and all of his doubts and all of those things and continue to take him step and stride across but he had to keep doing the little steps God gave him. And here was what's so interesting. Even the enemy knew his identity before he did. So the truth is, is God knows your identity. And he wants to get you there. And the truth is, is that the enemy of your souls knows your identity. And he wants to block you. But what you can do to get to that place where you become a mighty man of valor or whatever women like to be. 
I don't know, women like to be mighty women of valor? Maybe, maybe not. I'm Paul Amayo, right? You know, really, who God has made you to be. You, exactly as God intended, is you just take his hand and you keep doing the steps he asks you to do. It's not a matter of coming up with a better strategy, a better striving, a more. It's just, okay, God, what do you want me to do next? And as you take those steps, the picture I've had in my mind is like when my dad used to, to get us across these big rivers, and I was just this little dude. And uh, I was looking at some pictures on, on uh, November 2nd. My dad's would have been 69th birthday. And, and I remember this picture where he's holding my hand, and there's this big river, and there's all these rocks that we have to jump to. And, He's just got my hand, and I don't, I'm not worried about anything, even though this, uh, this river could just destroy me because I got, he's got my, me, me in his hand. And he's just like, you know, okay, jump to this rock. And then he's like, okay, jump to this rock, this rock. And I'm just like, eh, you know, eh, I'm, not, I'm not worried about it at all because I know he's going to get me to the other side. And that's what walking in the Spirit is. If you will invite Christ into your life, His Spirit will come and live in you, and then His Spirit will say, hey, uh, I want you to go talk to this person. I want you to go throw that thing away. I want you to go to, and He'll give you the steps. And He'll give you the provision for those steps. And as you take those steps, you will be very afraid, but once you take those steps, the goodness of God will show up. And after you do that for a while, you begin to really trust those things more and more. But the thing is, they keep getting bigger and bigger because God's making you bigger and bigger. So that's all it is. It's learning to not live out of this self anymore, but learning to live out of the Spirit and follow the things that He gives us to do. And that will get us back to where we're living and experiencing the innocence that God has intended for us from the very beginning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you very much that you have good intentions. You always have and you always will. I thank you that even the sin and the fall of man and our own sin and depravity can't keep us from your good intentions because what Jesus has done is far more powerful than any wrong we could or have ever done. Please help us believe it, Lord. Please help us keep taking steps with you. Please help each of us to know what is the next step. We're hungry for the next step, Lord. We've been fearful, but right now, today, we are hungry for the next step. Because we want the freedom, the fullness that you've intended for us. So please bring it, Lord.